New York and on the new Hot 97 app. Ebro in the morning. On Hot 97. Ebro in the morning, Laura Styles, Rosenberg, ladies and gentlemen, give it up one time. Melvin Farmer, community organizer, hitting corners. Also one of the founders of the Gangster Crips out in Los Angeles. Uh, but more importantly, uh, doing a lot of, um, you know, conversation right now. We lost a great one that was a part of our hip-hop community, Nipsey Hussle. And a lot of people did not know the impact he was having on his local community until uh, he was taken from us. Yes, sir. Um, so we have you here today because you were one of the people that actually helped the gangs unite after this moment. And other moments, you've actually done it before. But in this moment right here, obviously, uh, we hear about Nipsey's murder. Um, you get with the community and bring everybody together. Why was that so important in that moment? Well, in that moment, uh, uh, the night Nipsey uh, was slain and condolences to his family and all mothers that have uh, lost uh, loved ones and families to sisters, gun violence. But a lot of people didn't know uh, the 60s, and I myself had been talking three years. That's actually why the violence and murders went down from the 2015 incident. So uh, at that time, everybody thought it was going to be a trays in the 60s because we knew from social media how rumors didn't get started. So actually, we were prepared. So uh, I get the call from the one man I'm tied to the hip with them for three years, and he tell me, uh, Nipsey been shot this before it's announced. The next call I get, uh, they say Nipsey had died, but the public didn't know. And I, if you look on my Facebook on Hidden Corners, you'll look at the timeline. And I said, allegedly, but I knew he had died then. That was to stall it. Then the third thing they told me was it was internal. So the next thing we did was uh, start telling other groups and organizations they side, they side that it was an isolated incident. And that's why nothing didn't happen at that moment when everything was up in the air. And that's how the atmosphere was from there. So, and, uh, so it was an important distinction that it was an isolated incident. Yes. And that changed the tenor of in conversation. That mean everybody step back, fall back, and let them handle it. And that's what happened. And you, your role in general that you've been playing as someone who, uh, as an OG, is having your ear to the ground and everything that's going on um, in that entire scene. You said specifically, I know you're talking about rolling 60s, but is it... Is it is that across different neighborhoods? It's and across all? anywhere, any set, anywhere, United States. I've been in this game 48 years. I've been around those that didn't join sets. They started sets. Right. So when the Crip on Crip started, uh, I fell out. So I couldn't do that or go against the guys I grew up. See, I'm not from that era. That's a different language. Hmm. So I, I retired at 17. By 17? Then, I had 40 arrests by then from building what we're doing, where we stand today. So my word is good because I never crossed. So you can imagine 40 years of these guys fighting, but I know both of them equal, so I stayed out of it. And that's why I go down. Now, now Melvin, can we go back? Um, you know, we're in a place right now where you are helping uh, the community heal itself and people come together. Um, and I, I've seen some videos of you talking before about how things started for you as a youngster and what was going on around you. For the people watching, can you articulate some of that environment as you as a youngster and, and how the gangs really started? Well, they've always had gangs. That's right. Don't forget that. They've had businessmen, Slawsons, prior to that, the 30s. The only difference in the Crips and Bloods, they anti-black. Anti Everything else was pro black That's why I stopped the movement, stopped. And actually, uh, I, can you? Re I want you to reiterate that again because a lot of people don't understand what you're saying. Most black, uh, uh, where they're protesting or something, we have to remember civil rights was going on then. The guys was uh, fighting, and they were pro-black for blacks. Uh, say, for instance, the Black Panthers passing out lunches. Mm -hmm. The Crips, we taking lunches, mm -hmm. so we anti-black, and that's the difference. When we went to prison. But let, at 17, 15, we didn't know what we was doing. There's three things that happened in the early 70s that are staples in America today. Soul Train, Pop Locking, and Game Banging. All three of them are still talked about today. So we didn't know what we was doing at 13 and 14 years old, but we did have fun. And then as we got older, 
uh, it just grew and grew and grew. But the core in 79 was the pivotal year. Tookie got arrested. Uh, I was with Raymond Washington the day before he got killed. Then all those that were juveniles that could go to jail 40, 30 times because they never had no laws for what we was doing. So you can never emulate and do what we doing. But I want to tell the nation and the public what you can do to make history is fall back, change it and give back to the people, then y'all will be history. But other than that, you're riding a dead horse down a dark canyon. And do you think that most people have been able to um, wrap their minds around what you're articulating right now, that you know the way that organi organizations and neighborhoods became anti-black and, and perpetuated this, this gun violence and this gang banging. Do you think that people are there yet and ready to receive well, that? Right now, you got two of the most, well, you, it, it's no high level to go to when it comes to Crips and Bloods. They up under the uh, uh, neighborhood umbrella or the gangster umbrella, so we here, mm -hmm. we now. Uh, and it's funny that no elected officials, nobody talked to us. They've been crying about this 50 years. Now we're here, and nobody got an answer. But see, we got a plan, not a promise. Right now in L.A., uh, we're going back to the old days. That's what it's going to. West Side, East Side, Compton, and what they do over there, that's their business. What they do over there, their business. But what we do right here, you come over here and hurt a black, we're going to make it uncomfortable for you. It's already been said. To black and black crime is a violation. On our side, level. we ain't having no problems, no shooting, no nothing, and they keep throwing this peace, truce. No, that ain't what this about. We just fell back, we give them respect, and we don't use that term over in Death Valley. All the other ones, uh, whatever rallies and other things they did, we still at the same point uh, where we started. So let's try something different, new, innovative, and updated. Melvin, if you, don't mind me, if you don't mind me asking, why the distinction between the word and not saying a truce or anything like that? What's the... Um... Because no parent or somebody that lost a child going to be at peace. Mm. You got men that have lost their families, families for five generations born into this. So they ain't trying to hear that. But you can fall back, stay in your lane. We're going to stay in ours. But if we choose to come, you know we coming in peace. See, we in the inner city... You can't tell. I can see a white or other as an enemy because they're not around us. But it's hard to catch a young black that's the same skin tone as me. It's like camouflage. I should be able to uh, uh, know that you're not an enemy. So we're setting that down to where not only that, but once we make it where it's free to walk, then we got economical empowerment. Now we can go talk about Black Lives Matter, police brutality, but until we clean our yards as a nation, everybody in America ain't going to respect what we're saying because we're still doing what we do to ourselves. So we're cleaning house so the other people's voices can be heard. And that's what this is about. Not my voice, not nobody else's voice. It's for the people to speak. We don't need nobody for this. We can run our own thing. Um, you have a documentary, or you're plan to, planning to put out a documentary entitled Before We Blew. Yes, sir. Um, can you tell us more about that? Uh, that's going to be a story of the 50th, year, 50th anniversary because uh, I feel there's nothing to brag about about killing for 50 years. So that's why I go back to you guys can make history, uh, the youngsters, everybody can be a, play a role. And it's going to tell three parts of the founders, those the uh, killers, the emulators, the entertainers, and how all this progressed to where we're at now and how they use this, where they profit in. And, you know, these guys on the streets uh, that out here committing crime and stuff, the only thing that's going to happen to you at the end of the day, you're going to be too old to work and too young for Social Security. So we try to get these guys where we give them a different chance, a different outlook, as opposed to leading them into uh, doing senseless gun violence. We want them to be taxpayers instead of tax burdens. Um, also with Nipsey, um, talk about his community involvement. We hear the stories, all the articles are being written now, but what he was doing right there on Slauson and Crenshaw and buying back that area where the Marathon store is and, you know, putting the fish market in and everything that was happening there. Um, give us some insight on what was really happening and how the neighborhood felt. Well, uh, actually, we went and filmed up there, what, a couple of weeks before that. And Nipsey was uh, a proponent of, uh, he liked it, uh, economic empowerment. Actually, that's why he was meeting uh, Marquise Dawson Harris, uh, because of gentrification. 
uh, up in that area, the Kenshaw District. You got the Ram Stadium, and they uh, they want a beautification, a gentrification. Whereas we Nipsey and them family felt that it was economical empowerment. Uh, when we went up there, he had bought the whole complex, he had bought the last two. So he was really giving back to the community. Uh, 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 and that's all I can say is he was a great guy that, uh, you know, got caught up like Tupac and all of them. And, you know, things happen. It's tragic. But uh, all around, he, he, he set an example. You don't have to... Uh, other guys, if you're mad because he did it over there, do what he do. Get your hood together. Y'all got to entertain us and stuff. Let them in be invest. But it all come back to being able to walk, to get there. Like we might have. He got a fat burgers. But before this, nobody four blocks away. They'll go ten blocks, miles away because of the terrain up in there. So now we're trying to make it to where when they do come back and uh, in, invest in our community, that everybody can come and enjoy it which doesn't exist now. Make it safe. Yes, safe passage. We saw, um, I mean, obviously all we've heard is just, you know, reports, but the man that was uh, shot with Nipsey, we read that he had just come out of jail and Nipsey was there to help him, you know, get some clothes to so he can look nice when he presented himself to his family. Now we've read that, that he went back to jail because of his gang association. Do you have any information on him or what's happening with well, him? Well, I actually know him, but I won't say his name. Uh, he's is in custody, and they did go back and arrest him because uh, it was that was a low thing to do. But, yeah, Nipsey uh, and people will say, well, he didn't have security. He didn't have that. Oh, he was slipping. No, he wasn't. He was being a, a good dude. Woke up to give a brother. Uh, I think right. my boy had been out coming off 20 years, and that's what happened. So that's all that went on with that. And uh, you can look on this internet or something. I think he gave an interview about that, uh, the brother that's uh, incarcerated right now. Yeah, and for people who don't understand, he, they put him back in jail just for being... Association. Association right. with another gang member when he just got out of jail. And he was just there to get some fresh T-shirts and drawers and get his, get his clothes And got right. shot. And got shot himself. Right. And, uh, and you know what's so cold? A lot of times he might not be a victim of violent crime because they'll say he's not eligible because... He's labeled as a gang member. That's another issue we're going to So you're address. not a victim of violent crime if now, you're if a you gang member? Now, if you got a tattoo in L.A. or a former gang member, you get shot with your kids, you ain't getting a dime. You don't get it. So my thing is we're going to attack that because how you know when somebody active or inactive because they got a tattoo, that don't mean they still. I got one from 50 years ago. Am I a crip? Am I going to get an ass? So how you going to tell me with the same thing a youngster got, how you going to dictate who active and who ain't? You're taking a guess. They need to get rid of that. Wow. Um, how how much of um, what goes on in uh, the gang world is financed by external forces creating these conflicts that we've seen over the generation, generations now? Well, let's just do like, let's go with intervention. Good example. Come closer to the mic for me. You might have nine O's, neighborhoods. They got a 5013C. They're getting hundreds, 200,000 grants. A Trey gangster don't get a dime. Haven't got a dime in 50 years. But we get, but everybody else getting money. Then you had a problem of where those that are on the intervention program ain't, some of them are, some of them not, but you don't get the interaction. It's like this intervention group is all allies. They allies, but they never come together. That's why this is unique and our first interventive, interventive program because you got two opposing gangs creating dialogue, that stops it before it stops. Not coming after the body, like that, that don't work. We was in the first gang program ever, 19, about 77, 78, we got $50 a week, and you had the biggest boys there from Pudding, Tam, T. Rogers, uh, 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 the Hoovers, uh, uh, Bulldog, uh, uh, Tookie, uh, Raymond Washington, a uh, uh, big bam that started Hoover, us and everything was getting fifty dollars a week. But the thing of it was, we were enemies, but we talked. That's the difference. You cannot do intervention and prevention when you don't have the combatants talking, and that's what they need to get to. So that changed in that. But what happens is nowadays they'll get that eighty thousand where we might ask for five dollars a gas. They can go ask for two hundred for a pistol. So we balance in the playing field to where any next meeting about what's going on there, the gangster crips got to be included. Or else it ain't no meeting. 
Simple as that. And so it, it does. There, It is about resources and community resources, and that's always been a conflict going on about. It's always been a conflict. By the way, they're doing gentrification and getting trains and stuff. we getting a new bus. Well, and I was going to go there next because I did have some dialogue and people asked me to be quiet because I know the pressure that's on that neighborhood over there. It's also happening in Compton and other neighborhoods with gentrification because they're putting a stadium down at the old racetrack, mm -hmm. um, which is almost almost finished. Yeah, uh, it'll be ready probably, I think, next year. Uh, Butts and them doing a good job out there. But gentrification, it always cleaned out uh, that area. When they built the Staples Center, they moved the homeless, right. locked them up. When they built the first farm, that house that Jack built, they took all the prostitute and drug dealers from the strip, and they did them. So whenever they, every stadium they built, it's always been some movement to where everybody get moved. Now in Inglewood, all the bloods all of a sudden don't got indicted over simple phone calls because of that, and they don't indict them. And, left and meanwhile, and right. the rent in Inglewood is going uh, from fifteen hundred dollars uh, a month to on a one or two bedroom to thirty five hundred dollars mm, a month. Mm, go to rent. Yeah. In Inglewood. You can go to I on, Ingle, I on Inglewood, a uh, bus uh, major page, and you'll see a lot that go on in Inglewood. And one of the main complaints is this rent issue to where they basically— People can't live there no more. They can't live there, and they're gouging them. And how much of what has just occurred with Nipsey's death has destabilized this community to where people are going to, A, want to leave? Uh, you know, who's going to buy this—who's going to maintain and— you know, this Claus and di uh, Crenshaw and Sloss and District, make sure it's financially maintained the way Nipsey was maintaining it to keep people in the community because that's the one thing that obviously when this happens, you have, you've lost a leader in the community, somebody who has the vision and has the resources and the connections and is bringing, you know what I mean? This, it, that's been taken away now. Mm -hmm. So I see this, I look, as an outsider, look at the community and go, okay, they've destabilized this area now and made people feel almost, uncomfortable in their own home. Well, I'm going to go to his parents and just what I've seen and know of them, and I don't think they're going to let that go down. Okay. Very, when you meet them, it's an aura about them because they come from their daddy. You can tell the daddy and the mama, whatever their uh, religion or beliefs, they don't let nothing shake them. And uh, I, it was him that I think instilled in him the economical empowerment. And I think, I, I'm not going to comment, but I'm going to say, the development going to continue because of uh, uh, Marquise Dawson and council district. But the thing is, that's that district. What about the 8th district? What about the 6th district? What about these districts, as Obama called it and eloquently described it as pockets of poverty? Mm -hmm. That's what he said he was going to address. And really, he need to get back him and Michelle because now we continue it and he can continue his journey. Mm -hmm. Like LeBron James. All these cats need to step out. You talk about Black Lives Matter when the police get killed, when one of us get killed. Now step to the mic. We're here. And they need to come. Um, Melvin Farmer, also working on, um, uh, says here, with the 8th District political candidate, Denise Francis Woods. Yes, sir. Um, what do you guys, and this is for the greater South Central. No, this is the same district. We all, okay. you, you all, we all in. The, that's the eighth district. We, we all right there. It's one side of the street. It's two point eight miles, uh, a prime land where they're building around it, gentrifying. It. And her belief is, uh, we have people that will invest in other things, economical empowerment, feeding the homeless. There's a lot of other things to where we're on the ground, like the homeless people. Uh, they're getting hit a lot over there because they got fluorescent lights that in another area it would be lit up. They cheapen them on that, and it don't have about 13 homeless people get killed because they dark, it's dirty. Uh, we got elderly where we have to post up. They might have three or four, uh, and this is district. He might have three or four ATM machines, but the old people got to stay there because one. So these are the type of things that go unnoticed that we've been doing. Uh, we got a program, we got it called the Breakfast Club for 30 years. Uh, Maxine opened a park with the elderly, and every day we got somebody there in the morning watching them that they don't even To make know. sure nothing happens. Oh, oh yeah. A lot That's of stuff amazing. like this. So it's a lot of things uh, that go undercover that just not spoken on. Uh, Melvin Farmer's his name. Um, as as people that don't live in L.A., how can we support? Just getting the word out and continue to have yeah, the conversation. Yeah, well, follow us on Hidden Corners and just follow the movement because you'll see it's going to go. We're going to Chicago. 
uh, uh, growth and development, and my boy Fred Hampton. We're going to New York. We're going to uh, Philly, Boston, uh, Ohio. We're shaping up to try to help change politics and make our vote count. We want to change these guys into voters to where our vote means something, particularly uh, in the inner cities, because a lot of people, that's state. So you have to look at your local elected officials, yes. the mayors. Yes. Those are easier to get out as opposed to the Maxine president. Water right. or somebody on the federal level because that deal with the land. We need to go in tight and get these elected officials out and interview them and see what they're really about. And that's what we're going to do. Melvin Farmer, thank you for your time today, man. Thanks, oh, thank Melvin. You, thank you, my you bro. so much. Appreciate it. Yo, Appreciate give it up it. one time, man. Y'all follow Hidden Corners. L.A. Gangs Unite.